This week, Bruins winger Glenn Murray. The NHLPA presents Be a Player, brought to you by EA Sports NHL 2003. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Welcome to Be a Player. I'm Brett Lindros, and this week I'm in Boston to profile one of the NHL's top scorers, Glenn Murray. This city is home to some of the most important sites in U.S. history, and one of the most important is the Cradle of Liberty, Fanel Hall. It was here that inspiring speeches made by Samuel Adams and other patriots led to independence. Later, I'll show you some of the sites around Boston, but first, here's part one of our Be a Player profile of Glenn Murray. Here's Murray scores! We're tied! Such a mess. Growing up in Nova Scotia, did the NHL seem far away? I guess with the closest team being in Quebec City, Montreal, or Boston. Most definitely. I mean, you, you dream to play in the NHL, but I mean, like you said, it was that it was further away. I never really got. I think I only saw maybe three games before I ever. You know, the first game I saw was in the, the Coliseum in Quebec Live, and it was amazing. You know, because you don't get to see it that much when I was growing up. Nowadays, the junior teams are there, the Mooseheads. I think they can feel it's a little closer now, and it's, there's a lot more chances for kids in the Maritimes to. So I'll make it to the NHL. After your last season as junior, you were called up to Boston. What was it like to play in the playoffs with no pro experience? It was wow. It was like, the funny thing is when I came up, I think uh, it was 92, and I came up for the playoffs at the end of the year. There was like four or five games left. There was a strike year, and they striked for I don't know how many games. The pace was amazing. It was like, oh, I don't know if I can keep up here. It's pretty good. And, uh, and to watch the veterans play every night, and it was just unbelievable. That was my first taste of, you know, playoff action. We went to the semifinals. We got beat by Pittsburgh. In 1995, you were traded to Pittsburgh. How did you react to that trade? It was just one of those things. I mean, uh, it was in the summertime. Uh, it was Brian Smolinski and I went to, to Pittsburgh. And, you know, I, I think it was good at the time because I was looking, for, you know, it was a change, I think, maybe that I needed. And there was a lot of superstars there. It was, uh, you know, playing, you know, with Mario and Thomas Sandstrom and Yager and Nedved and all these guys and Francis. What was your role, I guess, on the team at that time? How do you fit in with a team like that? It was tough. I mean, not to say I didn't get the chance to play, but, I mean, I think, you know, they had their top two lines and that was, you know, that was, they were all filled. And, it was a tough role, like I said, there wasn't any power play time or anything like that. I think I still was not really at the next step yet to mature-wise in my game. And, and I still had a little bit to learn and still had to get, you know, stronger and faster and, and quicker out there, not to be like two or three steps behind. And, you know, but it was good learning, learning from them. Your second season in Pittsburgh, you were moved at the trade deadline. How did you feel about going to L.A.? That was definitely the turning point for me, uh, going to L.A. and having a big role on the team and, and playing like, you know, Larry Robinson was the coach then and, and playing me in every situation and knowing that I can play in every situation really developed me and, and started, you know, I started to get more mature and, and it took all those years to kind of get get me to where it was at in L.A. All of a sudden, offensively, you seem to just like explode. Was it the culmination of the years beforehand, like you said, or was I think it's a confidence thing. I, I know a lot of people out there don't like saying confidence, but it's a, it's a big part of the game. If you have confidence that you know you can go out there and score, it's going to happen. Plain and simple. Terrific move by Glenn Murray. I was playing a lot. I was playing with uh, my center was uh, Brian Smolinski, and we really we really played well together, and we fed off each other and. Uh, just being a big, having a big role of that team, I think it just kind of helped it more and more every year. How did you feel about coming back to Boston, where you had started your career? It was definitely tough. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. When I first heard about it, you know, we just came off the great playoff the year before in L.A., and I thought we were, you know, we're getting a team together that we, you know, we're missing a couple of things. But, you know, you always think, oh, well, you know, I don't think they'll trade me. You never know. But it was nine games into the year, they traded me back to Boston. And I wasn't sure at first because, you know, I, when I left there, it was, you know, when I was younger, I didn't have a big role in their team and stuff like that. But, you know, coming in, I, I knew I was going to a really good team. Here's a race for the puck. Glenn Murray's after it. Stopped by Kluche. Scores on the rebound. I was excited, but once I got there, I started knowing the guys. And Sean O'Donnell again, he was there in good Boston. Old good old Odie. He was there. <laughs> he was there to uh, pick me up at the airport when we got traded. And 
it was tough at first, you know, it was tough getting settled back in, and, uh, but we had a great bunch of guys there and, and we had a great team in first place. And Once I get settled, it was good. It was, it was good to be back. Out of the box, the intercept, left in the middle, shot, oh. score! Glenn Murray, the all-star, puts the Bruins on top! It's now time for Be A Player Trivia. To play, send your answer to NHLPA.com slash Be A Player. All correct answers will be entered in a random draw with a chance to win an NHL 2003 game courtesy of EA Sports. All other correct responses will be entered for a chance to win an autographed NHLPA jersey. For complete contest rules, visit NHLPA.com and click on Be a Player. Who was the last player to win the Calder Trophy and the Stanley Cup in the same year? Glenn goes to the tunnel next. A lot of stuff going on down here. This is unbelievable. What is it, two miles? Two miles all the way down. Boston is one of the great NHL cities to visit. There's history, culture, cuisine, and of course, great sports teams. One thing you don't want to do in Boston, however, is drive. The city's central artery is a complete traffic nightmare. To alleviate some of the congestion, a tunnel is being built beneath the city and should be open in the spring of 2003. Today, Glenn Murray and I take a tour of Boston's Big Dig. My name is Brent Irvine and uh, work for Public Affairs for the Central Artery Tunnel Project. Good. Got some gear for you. Beautiful. We got you ready to go, so let's have some fun. Check Sounds it out. good. You're now ready. I'm ready. <laughs> You're ready. I look like one of these guys. Yeah, I can work down there. I thought I saw you in the village people. Was that you? <laughs> How are you? How are you? Nice to meet you. All right, Brent, I just was wondering if you give us an overview of the entire project, when it started, how long these guys have been working hard on this thing for. The project started in 1991 with the dredging of the harbor for the Ted Williams Tunnel. The entire project really serves one purpose, and it's to alleviate the traffic situation that's currently in the city of Boston. And it's been a real serious problem for the entire region for a number of years. And here we can see the unsung hero of the project, this brown steel, the underpinning, it holds up the existing artery while we're able to put a new tunnel system underneath the city. Was it hard to keep the existing roads, the highways here, open while this was going on? Yeah, that was probably one of the most difficult and challenging parts of the project. When do you think the project will be finished? We're looking at early 2006, about <laughs> 15 years worth of construction, but it's all worth wow. it. It's all worth it. That's it's all worth it. <laughs> A lot of stuff going on down here. This is unbelievable. One, what is it, two miles? Two miles all the way down. There's a lot of weight on this thing right now. Like a lot of weight. I can't see anything out of these blocks. <laughs> I can't. I'm like, what? We probably have over 20 guys, 25 guys oh, working, wow. working on the uh, the track. What they're doing is they're putting together the stainless tracking. It's going to hold the mesh that's above the uh, precast wall panel so you don't see the soldier pile. Okay, the I see. Wall. Okay. It puts a dress. It gives it a little better finish. And this is non-stop until everything's done. This yes. is like, keep yes. doing that? Okay. All right, Brent, we're here now sort of at the north end of the tunnel. Exactly how long is the tunnel? I mean, how far are we digging when we say the big dig? How, how, big, how big a tunnel are we talking about here? 1.86 miles, so we're just shy of two miles here in the northbound tunnel. And there's a subway right below us, too. That's right. This area that we're in rests right on top of, actually 36 inches on top of the blue line. So a lot went into this area that we're in right now. Dealing with all the, uh, what would it be, the electricity, the hydro, the cable, all the uh, different... All of those issues and getting an active tunnel right above active subway, so... Wow, incredible. And the floor underneath us is about three to four feet of open space. And the okay. fresh air is pumped down there and it comes in through these openings in the side wall. Fresh air comes in and it's sucked out through the top here in these openings on these concrete slabs that are on this steel girder frame. So the fresh air in through the bottom, pumped in through the side, right out. sucked out through the top. Wow, very ingenious. Yeah. Now it looks like a nice cheap project you got going on here. I'm saying at least five billion. Well, the entire project has a total budget of $14.6 billion. 
All right, Brent, I'm sure these aren't massive whistles. <laughs> what, uh, what are Glenn and I looking at right now? Well, right now we're in vent building number five, the largest of all the vent buildings. There are eight in all, and they make up the largest ventilation system of any kind in the world. The air is drawn into this huge room. Uh, there are actually two floors, 40 foot high ceilings. The air is drawn into this open space. Fan grabs the air, pumps it all the way down underneath the roadway. Into those vents that we those. saw in the tunnel. Exactly, exactly. And then right at the top. Exactly. It's amazing. Well, this whole project's unbelievable, actually. The size of it, the scope, I'm just now starting to get a feel for what has gone into this project, how much planning. Yeah. I appreciate you showing us around. I had a lot My of fun. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. My very, pleasure. Uh, very, very interesting. Nice meeting you. Okay. Have Thank you time. so much. Be a Player gives you a chance to ask your favorite NHL player a question. For your chance to participate, visit NHLPA.com. Brandon Lee Mullet of Lewisport, Newfoundland, asked Matt Sundin, who was your favorite player in the NHL when you were growing up? Brandon Lee, thank you for your question. My favorite players growing up in the NHL was Matt Snesson of the Montreal Canadiens at the time. And I also enjoy watching Kent Nilsson, both of them very talented players and obviously out of my native Sweden. So. And Borja Salmi, I can't forget him. But all three of those players were, were my favorites growing up. Coming up, Sabres rookie netminder, Ryan Miller. I made the decision that if I was ever going to be in the AHL, I was going to try and focus on winning and improving my game. That's all I was going to do. Time now for Be A Player Hit Parade. Boston's universities are world-renowned, and each year the hockey teams from Harvard, BC, Boston University, and Northeastern play for the city championship known as the Bean Pot. Ryan Miller played his college hockey at Michigan State, and in 2001, he won the Hobie Baker Award as the NCAA's top player. Here's Sabres goalie Ryan Miller on Next Generation. I was forward until I was about eight years old, and uh, I just really didn't like getting scored on. I couldn't stand it. And trying to get back in defense as much as I was on offense, and uh, you know, for a kid to back check, it was a little weird. So <laughs> you know, I was always fascinated with goalies, and just the uh, you know, really enchanted by the equipment and how they moved and what they did. And opposite end of the spectrum from what I was used to playing. And, Buckle back and full strength. Long shot. Miller made the save off his helmet and took it right off his head. Family connection that everyone would know immediately is uh, my three cousins played NHL hockey. Uh, Kelly Miller played for 13 years. Miller, a backhander, he scored! Kevin played uh, probably close to a decade. He's over in Switzerland right now playing. And Kip is still playing with uh, the Capitals. A lot of people have strolled through Michigan State in our family. That's kind of where our hockey ties really come from. You know, the three brothers uh, made it to the show and just kind of took it to the next level. I just feel like it was one of those years where everything clicked except that national title. If we had won that, I mean, you couldn't have written a storybook even any better. I mean, we won every championship we set out to go 
a great winning percentage in the league. I think we lost four games the whole year up until like the final four. Fewest losses ever at Michigan State. It's unheard of. I think uh, my first day, Miroslav Shatan came down in two breakaways and made me look kind of foolish. And uh, so I was kind of welcome to the league. And uh, after that, I kind of got my bearings, got my footing, and tried to work and learn as much as I could as fast as I can. I kind of absorb things and I really study how things are done. And I can appreciate when somebody uh, makes a play on me, and I'm not going to try and let that happen again. I made the decision early on that if I was ever going to be in the AHL, I was going to work on things they wanted me to improve upon. That's, that's all I was going to do. And uh, I was going to try and focus on winning and improving my game. Comes out in front of Hammerick, quick shot right by Miller! Hangs on to that one. Be a Player Trivia is brought to you by EA Sports NHL 2003. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Who was the last player? to win the Calder Trophy and the Stanley Cup in the same year. And go. Jury? No. Patty Roy? No. He uh, plays in the Eastern Conference. He won the Rookie of the Year. Gomez. There we go. There we go. Who's the last player to win the Calder Trophy and a Stanley Cup in the same year? Gomez. <laughs> That's it. He's American. Fair enough. Oh, American. Yeah. <laughs> Who was the last player to win the Calder Trophy and the Stanley Cup in the same year? He's got Gomez. Very good. Very good. I knew you'd be all over that. Well, he, he won the Rookie of the Year too. Though. That's not fair. Who was the last player to win the Calder Trophy and the Stanley Cup? Gomez. I can't even get my question. Did, 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 did. Gomez. Done. Here's a chance in front. And Richter can't stop it. And Gomez. Scott Gomez wow. has the hat trick. What a move. Boston scorer Glenn Murray next. I think Joe and I push each other, and it's good. It's good for the game, it's good for your team, and it's good for the league, too. Be a player, sponsored by EA Sports NHL 2003. If it's in the game, it's in the game. In a dozen seasons, Glenn Murray has established himself as one of the top scorers in the league. Last season, he was second in the league with 41 goals, and this year, he was an Eastern Conference All-Star. Here's more with my visit with the Bruins sniper, Glenn Murray. Snaps it off for Murray, dropping it off court. Court trying to find Murray, a shot, score! Trailing is Hal Gill, he shoots, stopped by Kluche. Murray tries to bank it in and he does! Only Jerome McGinley scored more goals than he knew last year. Did you always think that you could be a top NHL scorer? I think I knew I could consistently score 30 goals. To get score 40 last year, like it happened, I, I mean, I didn't think it would happen that year, you know, but I mean, like, I was playing with some pretty good players. And uh, I played with Joseph Stumple most of the year last year, and, and Samson often. I mean, what can you say about that guy? He's, he's pretty scary. And right shot, score! Samson off! Now this year, playing with Joe, it's just one of those things, you know, we have that chemistry thing, and I think once you have that, it's, it's pretty good. After finishing first in the East, what was the team's attitude heading into the playoffs last spring? It was great. I mean, you know, we, were, we had a great team. We were looking forward to the playoffs and, and a big rivalry. We were playing, you know, Montreal and then, oh, you better watch out. It's the eighth seed. They were hot coming into the playoffs. They were playing great. Their goalie was playing great. Their whole team was playing great. And we weren't really playing the best, you know, that we were playing all year, but no question about it, they deserved to beat us. We, we didn't come to play and, and it shows we got beat in six games. Over the course of the summer, you lost your starting goaltender, Byron Defoe, a 40-goal man in Bill Guerin, and defenseman Kyle McLaren was a holdout. What were your thoughts heading into training camp? We kind of knew it was going to happen. You know, I don't, think, I don't think they really wanted to sign Billy, which is too bad because he was a great leader for us, and he was, you know, like everyone knows around the league, he's, he's a great player. He was a big guy in our room, and, and I think we missed him. We didn't have Byron back. And Kyle wasn't there. It was kind of in shambles there in the summer. But uh, I think when we came to camp, a lot of people had already written us off, and and uh, I think we, we the guys knew in the room that we had a good team. 
you've been a part of Boston organization basically your whole career now. You talk to a guy like Jason Allison, Jason Allison contends that Ray Bork cut the salaries down here for years and years and years. He was looking for fair market value. He's a holdout. He takes off. Billy Guerin, big name guy. Teams would love to have him. Boston doesn't seem to want him. Is there a method to this madness with some of the accusations against Boston about them underpaying or not trying to win a championship? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, maybe they just, uh, you know, those players had peaked at the time. You know, they were ready for a big jump in salary. And I don't think, you know, like you said, Boston's not known to, to kind of want to jump up in salary that much for certain players. And there is a lot of players. I mean, there's Anson Carters in there. And, and it's weird how this team has had all these players that, you know, I think if you put them all on the same team, it's a pretty good team. How does it feel to be an all-star? You know what, it feels, it feels good. I mean, it was, you know, you weren't sure. I wasn't going to be disappointed if it didn't happen or, you know. And the trainer called me in and said, you know, what number do you want? I was like, what do you mean? I wear 27, what do you mean? And then he finally, tried, you know, explained it to me and it was either 28 or 72. And I was like, I'll take 72. From the Boston Bruins, number 72, Glenn Murray. You ever look at the thing and go, okay, I'm three points back from Mario or from Naslin's you know, lighten her up pretty good. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's kind of like, a, it, it kind of pushes you a little bit. I think Joe and I push each other. You know, for me, I, and for Joe, I'd love to go to beat Mario in the race, obviously. You know, and seeing that all those other players do well, like Ed Burt, Doozy, and then and Naslin in Vancouver. You want to make sure that you stay above them or try to beat them, and it's just kind of like one of those things that you push each other, I think. And it's, it's good. It's good for the game, it's good for your team, and it's, Good for the league, too. I'm at the site of the first battle of the American Revolution, Bunker Hill. Before the battle, Colonel William Prescott issued the famous orders, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Today, the Bunker Hill Monument provides a great view of the city of Boston. I'd like to thank Glenn Murray for donning the hard hat and exploring the tunnel with me. And make sure you catch next week's show, as we'll have more of your favorite NHL stars right here on Be A Player. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Brett Lindros is clothing supplied by The Coop, clothing for men, Toronto. NHLPA.com is your source for the latest stats, scores, and NHL player information. Click on Be A Player for the latest show information or to send us your questions and comments. You'll find it all at NHLPA.com. You don't know? I think you might be playing with Marty. Mr. Gomez. Oh, that was a good Ah, oh, I like that one. That'll be up for sure. Hi, Tara. That's a wrap. That's a wrap, dog. It's over.